All right. So we're in part six of Meeting God, the Unlimited Life. What we are speaking about is the life that God has made available in Christ. How far, how fast, how deep do we want to meet with God? Really? How streamlined? You know, they used to race cars in Bonneville Salt Flats because it was so flat, so smooth, and they would set land speed records. Look, we're going to have to get the salt in our lives, right? The purification if we're going to want to go fast and far and walk into incredible places. And as I said, to be satisfied with one attainments in your walk, it is not going to satisfy the hungry, thirsty soul. I've gone this far. I've done enough. Have you ever met someone like that? I have. I've known people. Well, I've gone this far. I'm satisfied. Yeah, you better hang on tight. Strap in the double strap seat belts. We're not talking 100 mile in here. We're going Mach 1 and above. In other words, we're going high speed. Okay. <laughs> until one, till you and I have been lifted into the place that God has called us to, that we know the place he's put us in, we were not going to know his presence, his peace, his joy. Now, I see I'm in the wrong place, but I'm going to the right place here. And we're in the right place spiritually, right? With the God and Christ in us. All right. I want to say this. If I have failed or fallen short, I ask for your forgiveness. But I cannot be bound, you and I cannot be bound. Bev, good morning, Marta, Sandra on FB Live, and Anne, good morning. We cannot be bound and limited and held back by the things of the world that are capturing people's hearts, lives, and minds and causing them to live that life of mediocrity and not standing for truth. How many believers do you know that when something comes against truth and instead of exposing it with light, they just let it wash over them and defeat them and they stand in that place of defeat? We are not going to stand in the place of defeat. We are going to rise into the glorious privilege of the sons and daughters of God. There's a book. Look, we've got, to, gonna, there's a book I'm going to get to. We've got to get beyond the petty feelings the enemy has put upon us to think less of ourselves and to think less of others. The love of God never fails and it never gives up. One of the big reasons Christian marriages fail today is because of the lack of love. The love that never gives up and the love that never fails. Now, I understand there's things that go on. I understand life. I understand difficulties. But think of it this way. Jesus Christ and his followers in the first century, or I mean when he was here, right on earth, before he had been resurrected, died, buried, resurrected, the crucifixion, all that. He loved people to the end all the way through. It was only those that didn't take in that love that missed it. In case in particular, Judas. The love of God was being shed abroad on his heart and life through Jesus Christ. But what did he do? He didn't choose to let love change him. We are ones that love is going to change us. Thank you for the hearts. Thank you for the shares. So appreciate it. What a blessing. There's a book by James Maloney I've been reading, who, is, who we're going to see this week, called Living Above the Snake Line. If you are having troubles with... Um, living below the enemy's line where his attacks are beating you down and you're not rising above to what God's called you to be. Look, the answers are in the Bible, but it's a pretty good book because in a section he deals with how our attitudes are toward others and how our attitudes are toward ourselves. Because as a man thinketh, so what? As a man thinketh in his heart, what's it say? Who knows that? No, it's the delay reaction here as always. So, yes, it's a, Charlotte, thank you. So is he, or is he, right? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 
What do you think about yourselves and what do you think about others? Look at the political realm and look how the attitudes of people are toward other people, how they're trying to promote things, how they're trying to block things, how they're trying to promote men's agendas, agendas of the world to bring bondage and defeat to people. It's better to have a limited government and let people make errors than to control the things about their life. Patty in Nebraska, good morning. So in this series, we are in part six, Meeting God, The Unlimited Life, and we're considering Smith Wigglesworth today. We have been considering in this series, men and women of God, not like, unlike you or I, as they went through the, and they each had to, as they went through life, they lived life. And it says about Elijah, remember he was a man, James 5, 17, that suffered like passions, desires, difficulties, challenges in life as we do. We think, you know, men and women of God, you know, like Deborah in the Old Testament or some, or Anna, maybe the prophetess or whatever. We think that, man, they must have had it easier. Or maybe we think that way or, or it wasn't as difficult as it is today. We got all this going on. All the difficulty is right here between the ears, right? That's where all the difficulty is. And the difficulty is, as we've considered before, you cannot go into the deep places with God with your mind. You put on the renewed mind, you put the, but it's the mind of Christ that is that mind set that we want to live, the renewed mind. But only, only as we break off every lie of the enemy can we walk in fullness. God's called us to fullness. We have the fullness of the God Christ in us. We have a complete anointing. Why do believers not walk in fullness? Because they haven't broken off the lies that the enemy has held them. He keeps their hearts and lives broken, and they are not free from the captivity that has already spiritually been broke off them, that is greater than the physical uh, captivity of this world. Until we see the unlimited life, as our reality, we're not going to live it. So we got to get going here. We got some things to go with. So we've been considering men and women in this series who rose above, uh, as James Maloney puts it, the snake line, the enemy's lies that have kept him in the defeat, discouragement, despair, and darkness of night and not the light of the day of the life that we're called to. So these men and women were not satisfied with their spiritual attainments or what they had attained to in their life. They were hungry and thirsty for more. And in their desperation, their deep desire to walk greater with God, they stepped further and further each day. They didn't stop each day and I've done pretty good. I've made it. They said, I'm going to walk greater today with God than I did yesterday. That means that I have got to step out in a greater manifestation of who I'm created to be, right? To see that. So they smashed through. <laughs> they, Apostle Paul, Peter, right? Stephen, people, you know, we read about. They smashed through obst every obstacle and barrier to experience an ever greater measure of the presence and glory of God and they did it in ways that are rarely seen in believers since the first century. It was the more of God, less of themselves, understand it, less of themselves being broken with humility, submitting themselves to God, giving up their desires of what they wanted to accomplish to have God's greater desires come in, fill their heart and life, and then every true desire of their heart being filled and met. So this road is narrow, right? And it's even winding. It has twists and turns. It is a path few have chosen to travel. It was so simply not enough to have the Spirit of God within them. They had to be fully imbued, walking with power from on high. That is permeate, permeated with the life that God made available. They refused to settle. They refused to settle for just one evidence of the Spirit, like speaking in tongues or prophecy 
or gifts of healing. They refused to settle for one working of the Spirit. They wanted it all in manifestation and operation. But they wanted to manifest fullness of the kingdom life. Remember this Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, and I know I missed a lot of you come in. Forgive me for that. But we're here to walk greater. If it's about me greeting you in, if it's about me uh, saying how great you are, it'll never compare. It won't have the candle, as we say, to the flame of God's Holy Spirit and what he's done in you. God himself calling you out from darkness to light. That wasn't my deal. It's my, not my deal, right? It's his deal. If you're hearing from him, my voice will fade in the distance and his voice will launch you into the deep places. If it's my voice that's carrying you, you're going to have mishaps on a misship. And that's not what we're about. So they desired above all else, these men and women were considering, and I hope and I pray and along that this is the desire of your heart, that to see God glorified every day in your life, not just once in a lifetime, and to have it done in a most profound and way that's possible with him. They were men and women that we read about in the Bible and that we're considering today, Smith Wigglesworth, that they could not bear or put up with any longer the normal Christian life, the Christian norm. Where is the power? Where is the love and authority of the original apostolic days? And when I say that, I mean the days of the first century, where the shadow of Peter, even the shadow of Peter, would cast out the devils and heal the sick. Look, we, our shadow gives out whatever we overshadows us. And God has no shadow because light has no shadow. And we are the light of the world. What's that mean that your shadow gives off? What do you give off? What are your words that you're releasing that are changing the atmosphere? What are the words you're releasing? What above all else do you want to live? That's going to come forth. What is your? What are you driven to and that God is leading you to? He doesn't drive us. The devil drives people insane. God leads us into the peaceful, pleasant places of his kingdom abundance and joy. So will we pursue in our walk with God to go onward, upward, and see a greater manifestation today than yesterday, uh, despite every pronounced earthly limitation that our eyes see, our ears hear, and so forth, and the news speaks forth, and so forth. Look, uh, yeah, sometimes... You know, these people with, did this with great fastings. Isaiah 58 gives us the true fast of the Lord. Men have made it one thing. God declared it's another. It's funny that the traditions of men preside more over fat, what is spoke about fasting today than what God has declared it actually is his fast. Isaiah 58 may want to read that. Okay. But it took much prayer, persistence, and perseverance, stick to it in this, in fact, it's even the word stick to it in this, to stick to what God has, to stay in there, to the hang into the Velcro of his love, and not be separated and walk in the mediocrity of life. Ridding our lives, ridding, get rid of every earthly passion, our fleshly, soulish ways and desires that zap the strength, the power of the manifestation of the God in Christ in us coming into a fullness, whereas we walk forth, the, 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 the valleys become hills, the hills become valleys. You, I think you got an idea. In other words, life changes. Uh, thermostats, not thermometers, as has been up, brought up before. These men and women battled on, they fought for the right to walk in who they were. Now, wait a minute. The right has been given through Christ to us. But, uh, yeah, there's something else I want here. I'm going to have to find it, aren't I? 
So, and I will. It, I'm going to come back to that. I'll find this. So, uh, let's see. They were men that were truly broken in women and humbled themselves before God. And they were true possessors, as the scriptures say, of clean hands and clean hearts. Only God. They weren't looking out for themselves. They were looking to the God that was looking out for them. And he met them, as I've said, in the most profound way. Do you, my brother, my sister, my friend, do you hunger and thirst for God more today than yesterday? Are you attaining greater spiritual territory today than you have in the past? Will you choose this kind of life? Do you desire to see God glorified in a greater way than you ever have been before? Well, it's going to start in your prayer time, in your closet, in that place with God, calling those things which are not as though they are an expectation of mighty workings of signs, miracles, and wonders in your life. Stephen didn't sit back and just wait for things to happen. He went forth and he did the signs, miracles, and wonders. It says of Philip, right? Do the signs and wonders, whatever it says that he was doing. God gives you a spirit. It is God working, but it's his working in you that you walk out, you carry out, you manifest forth. That brings the change. Why do believers, are they trapped in the mediocrity of life? Because they're waiting for a greater filling when they've already been filled. They're waiting for a greater manifestation when they have the fullness of the manifestation of the God and Christ in them. What are you and I waiting for? What are you and I here waiting for? There was a couple quotes from Patty today. You know, I have each of you, so nothing, thank you, Ralph, each of you, to give thanks to because you surround me with the love and compassion of the Father and you speak things into my life. I've shared before how I had for years such a poverty mentality. God could never bless me with uh, abundance because I was always striving to uh, get to something that came from rest and not striving. How many of you are striving financially to enter into something that's already been declared yours when Christ said he came to give you life more abundantly, more completely, more fully, and not only more completely, but in its completeness, in its fullness. How much striving, how much strain did Jesus Christ have to do to manifest the kingdom? Did he have to get prayed up? Did he have to take some more Bible classes? What was a zero, Robert says? What was the difference? Stephen, welcome on FB Live. Amy, Hans Freller, good morning. Jeannie, welcome. Jean, oh, well, I, yeah. Great to have you here on track. So a couple quotes, quotes by Patty that kind of rocked me this morning as we were talking. We were kind of talking about quantum physics and different things. Crazy stuff, but things that God set up. So this is, everyone is waiting on God. Everyone. God is waiting on us. After Pentecost, there was no more wait. What are you waiting for? The enemy is invisible, but he's not fictional. It's not some story made up. We must believe that believing is the key and walking in love or will never manifest the love and the faith it takes to manifest the kingdom now. Promises are placed within our reach, but not always in our hand. We are not here, as I've said, to be men pleasers. We are here to first love God, live his love, will be known by our love, and present it forth and fullness at this time in our world. What are you going to do today to shake this evil world and the darkness? How brightly will you choose to shine 
What words will you speak that will change the atmosphere? Who will you minister the kingdom of love and light to today? Are you ready? Are you willing? You are enabled. So, let's go into this a little bit. And again, we're looking from man's perspective more than God's perspective. But we need God's perspective, not man's perspective. We want to come in agreement with the word of God, not in agreement with men. Unless that man be the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, we want to be in full agreement with him. Remember in Acts, what's it say? They took note of them. They observed that they had been with Jesus. Maybe we just need to be with the Jesus more. Do you know what I'm saying? With our God, the one who's taking us to the Father. Smith Wigglesworth was without a doubt one of the most anointed men of his time period. There was plenty of others. I tell you, because fire begets fire. If you take a candle and light another candle, what happens? Another flame is lit. Will you be a candle one who lights the flame of another, or are you sitting around in the darkness and in, in the in the in the uh, in the corners of life, waiting for someone to light your life, or are you going out and lighting others' lives? But he was. Let me restate: each believer is anointed with Holy Spirit and dude with power from on high. It is our genuine Holy Spirit. Love-filled, uh, faith-energizing or empowering walk that the glory of God is manifested forth. If we don't believe, Angela, good morning. Beverly Sue, good morning. If we don't believe that the key is Christ, the master key is Christ who bridges the chasm, the gap between God and man and start walking who we're created to be, we're going to be sitting in that corner in the darkness of despair waiting for someone to light us. And when they light us, we flicker for a moment and then we start smoking again. The flame goes out because we are in the flame of the fire of God in the place we're supposed to be. You can be a spectator or a participator actively engaged in manifesting forth the kingdom of love and light, or you can passively let darkness prevail. Darkness prevails in passivity. Power, love, and light comes forth being actively engaged in who we are. So this Smith Wigglesworth dude, <laughs> this minister of the kingdom, as they called him the apostle of faith, if anyone deserved to, be, deserved to be described as full of faith and Holy Spirit, here's one. And there's many others, T.L. and Daisy Osborne. People we read about in the New Testament, right? And even in the Old who had spirit upon them, not in them. People that I'm with now this weekend, people that are coming. Oh, yeah, I was going to do a healing service today, right? I mentioned I was doing healing. We're going to shift that to Friday. Bev, you're on. <laughs> Y'all start, Patty, Robert, we're going to be getting words of knowledge. We're going to be releasing words of knowledge for healing Friday. Look, don't go, not me. I'm not stepping into that. That's what I'm talking about. We're sitting in the shadows of darkness when we're supposed to be walking in the light with power. God is giving out the words of life in the kingdom to break the enemy off. Look, it only takes one word to break the captivity of the enemy. One word. That word is Christ, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. In him, that connection he has to God in him that we receive is the key, the master key that breaks off all the works of the enemy. Robert and I were working on a car yesterday that had some problems. There was a lot of things not working on the car. You know, we had wires everywhere. We're like, is there a short? Is there a disconnect? It turned out to be two fuses, I believe it was two fuses that were burned out. Once those fuses were replaced, the connection was good. We don't need a replacement for Christ. We need to know who we are in Christ and place ourselves in the deposit that's been put in us and release that deposit. You've heard it said, if you had a million dollars in your bank account and you didn't know it, 
what good would it do you? Well, far something far greater than a million dollar deposit beyond earthly value has been deposited in your care. Do you care to know what it is and to walk with it? So some of the miracles and things that Smith saw, Smith W., Smith Wigglesworth saw, what an odd name, right? He was a plumber. He was a plumber and God called him from plumbing into the ministry. Incredible. So the miracles he saw rarely and seldom are seen because people don't go into the deep places with God and they are atmosphere changers. He saw people born blind, deaf, cripples, twisted and deformed by diseases, he manifested miracles and healings. He saw people on death's door and the dead raised from the dead, including cancer and every manner of sickness and disease. You know why? Because he pursued the high calling that he knew he was called to. He wasn't in the corner. God, help me. He says, God, I'm here to help the world because Christ is living in me and I'm going to go make a change. Right? One of his accounts was there's a dead guy, right? A dead guy. And he picks the guy up off the floor, slams him against the wall, says, life, come in him. He lets go. The guy drops to the floor. He's dead. You know what he does? He quits. No, he didn't. He grabbed him again, put him up against the wall. Life, come in him. Let him go. He dropped again. You know what he did? He didn't quit. He went in there, picked him up, put him against the wall. Life, come in him. And you know what happened? The guy was alive and whole. Um, I, I will put, someone's asking about these sharings. I, they are on, you can go through my Facebook page or you can go on Periscope and see the uh, broadcast. I'll probably put them on YouTube too. Okay. I want to get back going here. So we, he saw some of the greatest miracles and healings that have been known in the last century or so. But others too, you know, we got Oral Roberts, right? We got James Maloney, who we're going to go see. People who are, you know, he's alive today. He's still doing mighty works of God. What are we doing? Are we talking the kingdom? Yes. Are we going and doing it? Yes. Are we just going to talk about it? No. Are we just going to do the miracles? No. We're going to manifest the fullness of the kingdom here and now. That means supply in finances so that you are able to go forth. One of the things Smith asked the father, he told father, he says, when I go and do this ministry, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. That was his first thing. I'm going to go. I'm committed. He said, God, you've got a supply for me as I go. And you know what? The Father supplied for him. Who supplied for Christ? Who supplied for the first century believers? So he's born in 1859 into poverty, Smith Wigglesworth. He was converted by the Methodists at eight years of age. Even then, he was so hungry for God and hungry for his souls, even in his youth. So when most of the boys in the choir were, because he was part of the choir uh, at 12 years of age, uh, where he was confirmed by the bishop, they were like, they would talk about girls or where, you know, 12, I'm not talking about girls yet, but they would talk about worldly things. But something happened in his confirmation where he only wanted to talk about God, his goodness, his love, his might, his power. Pam, such a joy to have you be here with you. So most of the boys of the choir, they were just even at 9, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15. They just wanted to talk about things of the world. Smith would not do that. He said, I want to talk about the kingdom of love, light, and power. And that's what he spoke about and did in his youth. His whole body, this is from him speaking, his whole body was filled with a consciousness of God's presence. Are you and I filled with a moment-by-moment -moment consciousness of God's presence, or is it like presence, or is it like once a year? Are you a once-a-year Christian? Are you like a one-a-day vitamin? Are you an, or you an all-time, all-on, full blast with the glory and the life of God? So his whole body was filled with a consciousness of God's presence, a consciousness that remained with him. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to go down here a little bit. Later, you know, he had a full full baptism in the water. Okay, baptism, water, baptism, the spirit. Look, baptism, the water, awesome. 
baptism of the Spirit, incredible. Jesus Christ said, John truly baptized with water, acts like 1 5. But you will, you shall, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be baptized with Holy Spirit not many days hence. Water baptism is an external baptism washing on the outside. Hey, the Pharisees actually did that. Didn't they wash their hands and different things? When Christ came, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when you and I got born again, the washing came on the inside. And until the inside gets clean, the outside is still dirty. It's going to get dirty. But the cleansing that came on the inside when the power and the might, the truth and the love of the Holy Spirit came in, now there's been a shift because we've Water baptism couldn't get you from the kingdom of earth, kingdom of men, to the kingdom of God. It took a Holy Spirit baptism in our lives to be endued with power from on high. That endued means clothed with spiritual light and armor of God. <clears throat> so his years, he started well before Azusa Street that we read in Acts, I mean, uh, read about in like 1906, 1908, that time period. Uh, before or early of the, really before the Pentecostal movement. He had such a hunger for God and he experienced many breakthroughs to new levels. Now they say anointings. I'm going to say manifestations of the evidence of God because you are anointed to go and to manifest the power and the anointing. People a lot talking about someone having a greater anointing. When you, is Christ fully anointed? Is Christ fully anointed? That's my question. Is Christ fully anointed? He is. Evangelist Bridget Burgess, good morning. He is. Well, who's in you? Dumbo? Christ in you. Christ in you. When you walk down the street, it's Christ in you. You've got the armor of God, but you have to use it. Christ in you to cause victory. Have you heard it once? Like, I walk down this side of the street like I'm going to buy in the other side of the street. Like, in other words, I'm claiming what it belongs to God. And when I'm with the sick, the lame, the deaf, the blind, I'm claiming their life for God to manifest the kingdom. I'm not looking, boy, it'd be nice if FC walked in. <laughs> you know what I mean? Be nice if James Maloney walked in. I wish Smith Wigglesworth were here. I wish Christ were here. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you know who you are and what God has created you to be in our world. Do you know? Are you a candle in the corner and darkness smoldering? Are you lit full of flame with the glory of God? Big difference. Big difference in manifestation of what comes forth as you reach forth and touch this world with the kingdom of love and light with your hands, with your voice, as you look and as you hear what God has to be spoken forth and lived. So he says, let's see, you know, he worked with uh, the Plymouth Brethren. He worked with the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army used to be hot for God. They were a ministry outreaching and they, God was doing great things. But somehow the things of the world filtered in and they decayed into what they are today. I'm not saying they don't do a good work, but good works won't cut it. Manifestation of the kingdom will. You are called to manifest the kingdom here and now. That's why you're here. You are here because God's declared long ago. He said, my son and daughter, there they are. I see them. I see them walking forth with the might and power of the Christ in them and breaking off every work of darkness. He didn't say they will break some of the works of darkness. They, they'll do good in a few. He said, all and all that we would manifest the Christ in us. That's why he said same and greater works. Why are we doing less when we're called to greater? Why aren't we even doing the same when we're called to that? What is our issue? Why are we hiding out waiting for God to do something greater when the greatness of the God in Christ has come? When you speak that which we loose, we speak is already loosed in heaven. That which we bind, that we block, the enemy is already bound in heaven. That's why we were talking about quantum physics or theory or whatever it is, that when you speak, it has already been spoken in heaven and you are just coming in agreement what has been declared and it manifests forth. That's why when I speak the blind eyes to open, 
I don't, I'm just speaking with an agreement what's already been declared in the God and Christ in the throne room of God. And he says, we're to walk in. And you know what? The eyes open, not because I'm special, not because I'm great, not because I have some ability beyond any other believer. It's I'm in agreement with whom my father says, are you in 100% locked in, loaded in agreement with your father today? 99% won't cut it. 98% is even getting farther away. 99.9% will, won't cut it. We have to step in to the manifestation of the glory of the sons of God. Christ said that the Father gave him this glory, that the Father gave him glory, and he says he gave it to us. The glory that was given to Christ by God is the glory that's been given to us. What are you doing with this glory covering in your life? Right, Patty? Right, Patty? Yeah. yeah. So I don't want to talk too much about it, that part of his story. Let's see. I'm going to move on here a little bit. So he describes an experience he had um, when uh, he had this experience. So experience, you know, I've been heard experience is no guarantee for truth. But without the experience of the reality of the God and Christ in you, you'll never experience the reality in the world of manifesting the power of love and light of the kingdom. So he says, uh, this lady, this minister's wife laid hands on me and then I had to go out of the room. The fire fell. It was a wonderful time as I was there with God alone. He bathed me in power. I was conscious of the cleansing of the precious blood and I cried out, clean, clean, clean. I was filled with the joy of the consciousness of the cleansing. I was given a vision for which I saw the Lord Jesus Christ. I beheld the empty cross because he's resurrected. He's not on the cross anymore. Are you living a life with Christ of the Jesus that was on the cross? Or are you living the life of the Christ that's in you that's resurrected at the right hand of God and you're seated there with him in the throne room? Come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? Because he's placed you there. He, you didn't get there. He puts you there. Are you, are you a worm? No. Are you wimping out? God, it would be nice if this would happen. No. He says, go forth and do it. What are you waiting for? So he says, uh, he started speaking in tongues, giving praise to God. Then, um, and he spoke, spoke about many, many anointings he'd received previously, but this was like a greater anointing. When Christ comes in, you get the fullness of the anointing. What happens is we step into greater realms of glory with our Father. Okay, a little different perspective there to think about. So, um, as after this experience, there was no stopping Smith Wigglesworth. He was a flame for God. He wasn't a smoldering wick. He was a flame for God. And the fire fell wherever he went. The fire fl uh, fell wherever he went because the fire was in him to release. The fire comes out of Christ because it's in him to release, right? It's in you to release. Why are you going out? Boy, I wish I could heal that person. Well, until you start doing it, you aren't going to see it. Our eyes wide open to the revelation of who we are and what we have in Christ. Our eyes being our sight in the kingdom and not the world. Are we hearing the words where that's not just a nice saying, you know, I can do all things through Christ with me, which strengtheneth me, but he's actually strengthened me so I can go do it. So I go do Yes, Nelson Fox says, expect and believe and do not doubt. If you say unto the mountain, right, Nelson? Be cast into the sea and shall not doubt. I have said this. The doubt is you're not holding the shield of faith up. Doubt, worries, and fears mean your spiritual armor is on the ground. You haven't picked it up and aren't using it. That's where doubt, worry, fear come in. You don't know the armor you have, armor meant you have, and you're not using it. Look, you got the armor, use it, okay? Look, I know the enemy comes in with lies. I know he comes in with deceit. He comes in with ways to trick us, but we don't hang on to his lies because it's a lie. We hang on to the truth because our life does depend on it, and that person's life that we're going to minister to today their life depends what words we're holding fast to. So let's see. Um, 
Yeah, he says we can be nothing less than flames, nothing less than mighty instruments with burning messages, with hearts full of love. We must have a depth of consecration. Something happens deep within our spirit and our man. Yeah, yeah, just do it. Just go for it, right? You shall go forth as mighty sons and daughters of the king. So he was, a. let's see, uh, he realized, yeah, 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 there's some good stuff here, but he was certainly a possessor of the audacity, the daring, the boldness of life, which is rarely seen in Christi Christendom in modern today. Did you hear that? He was a knew who he was in Christ. That's what it's telling us. He was certainly a possessor of the audacity, the daring, and the boldness. How many times have you stood somewhere, you'd like to see a manifestation, an evidence of working of God, and you're saying it would be nice, but you've mentally assented to that truth and not actively carried it out. Do you know that mental assent, agreeing with God, mental assent, gets you everywhere except seeing the evidence of the power and love of God shown forth. <laughs> It does nothing. Mental assent gets you nowhere. Just agreeing is not enough. You have to act, right? James, let me tell me about your works. Let me show you my works. Look, Christ went forth doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. He went and did. Know what we're to do? Go and do. Same thing. So, um, he, it was not uncommon for him in his meetings that he prefaced with a model of a miracle. In other words, he'd say the first person that, let's see, to stand, even if they were the most deformed cripple, would be healed. So he'd say, whoever, you know, I'm, God's going to declare his mighty work and it's going to start with a miracle. Whoever needs a miracle, stand up. And the first person that stands up is going to receive that miracle. Uh, yeah, I did this once. <laughs> I need to do it more. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to be, everybody that needs a miracle, stand up. You know what? And it's just going to be done. I've seen it happen. And, but I mean, I've never done everybody. So that's what we're, that's what I'm going to next. I'm going to go into crowds. Who needs a miracle? You ever watch those, uh, that was it, uh, Holy Ghost maybe with that, that like punk rock or hard rock band Korn, K-O-R-N. And they're out there. People are coming in for a concert for the, yeah, that whole thing. And Todd White and all of them are out there. They're going, who needs a miracle? Who needs a healing? And they're ministering healing. And people are being healed. <laughs> they, we got people that go into the dark places. We love hanging out in the light. But you know, the light shining in the light. You want to see the light shine? You got to go into the dark places. Yes, Charlotte. Yes, we got to go into the dark places. That's not sitting around waiting for something to happen. We're going forth and ministering life. L-I-F-E. Are we communicating? We are communicating words here. Are we receiving them? But are we going to mentally assent to the truths or are we going to manifest and act on what we have? If we're going to mentally assent, we might as well just stay in our rooms and read our Bibles all day. How powerful and how wonderful the Word of God is. But its effect is not known until it's spoken and acted on. He says on one occasion, Smith Wigglesworth, on one occasion, and he says typical occasion, this was the norm. What's your norm? Here's his norm. A man came forward for prayer for stomach pain and commanding the pain to be gone, Wigglesworth punched the man in the stomach. Not saying punch people. <laughs> but he punched the man in the stomach so hard that he went halfway across the room completely healed and with no pain or like injury from the punch. <laughs> this kind of thing happened more than once. In his later years, he didn't do as much of that as I understand, or he got softer. But he, what he believed he was doing, he was punching the enemy out of the people when he did it. Crazy, right? Awesome, awesome and wonderful. So uh, Wigglesworth believed in commanding the sick to be healed in Jesus' name. Are you commanding 
to what to happen, what's already been declared and loosed in heaven and what's been bound. He was an aggressive man of holy faith, right? He was even, you could say, in our terms, what we've seen today, we might even say violent, right? He took the kingdom by force. Uh, taking ground from the devil, right? He, he was taking that ground from the devil by force. And yet he was a man of great compassion and tenderness as well, of, but he walked in great authority. I tell you what, when you and I walk in town, do they know that Jesus has walked in town? When I come into town, things change, devils run. I tell you, I don't get to cast out too many devils. You know why? Because they flee, because they know I'm coming. <laughs> what about you? When you come, does the devil run? <laughs> that is our life and our calling. So uh, many people were raised from the dead. We mentioned this. Here's an account of one occasion. Maybe, uh, I don't think this is the one I mentioned. Okay. My friend said, she's dead. She's dead. She's dead. He was and was scared. I have never seen a man so frightened in my life. What shall I do? He asked, full of fear. Are we full of faith or full of fear? I can watch your actions, hear your words, and I know where you're at spiritually and how far you're going to go. We have to have a shift into our words and actions line up with our Father's Word. We need to know the Word. We need to know the Christ that lives in us. So, he said, uh, what shall I do? He asked. You may think that what I did was absurd, but I reached over into the bed, pulled her out, carried her across the room. Oh, maybe it's the one I did talk about. And uh, carried this person across the room, dead from the bed, and stood against the wall, held her up. She was absolutely dead, no life at all. I looked into her face and said, in the name of Jesus, I rebuked the, this death from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. Her whole body began to tremble. So this is a different one. This is a different one than the one. In the name of Jesus, I command you to walk. I said, I repeated, in the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, rise up and walk, or walk. And she walked. Not only was this woman raised from the dead, but it was, in, was instantly healed from a terrible illness that caused her death. Complete. Look, what illness is greater than death? What illness is greater than death? I don't know anything. That, that, that's like, Robert, good morning. I mean, that's dead, right? That's gone. So, maybe you just need to go out and raise some from the dead, and then you'll start figuring out everything else is lesser. There's no greater miracle than the God in Christ in you. No greater miracle than the new birth. But do we know it? Do we know what's on the inside? Or are we mentally assenting? Are we agreeing with something that we've heard, we've read, and we go, that's a nice story for the day. Now, let's just go live life. No, let's go kick the devil's behind you. Let's have the joy of the Lord as we do it. And it's peace that prevails in our hearts. So this woman that raised from the dead, instantly healed from her disease, instantly raised from the dead in that moment, began to testify to people of her death experience and restoration. It has been recorded that he raised 30 or so people from the dead. You know, today, alive today, we have people like David Hogan and uh, Heidi Baker and others who are raising from many from the dead. And as far as I know, within their ministry groupings, probably now we have over a thousand people raised from the dead. But here's the deal. How would you like to go learn from David Hogan? Yeah, I don't know if you know David Hogan. He's in the, all the ministers have left Mexico where he's at, but his family. They get tied up. They get held at gunpoint. Ministers get killed. They generally raise them from the dead after they've been macheted to death. Incredible workings of God. So let's say you want to go learn from uh, David Hogan what's happening with him. You have to sign a sheet that if you're killed, they're not responsible. In other words, you're going into the deepest, darkest place, the deepest hell holes, and you're going to learn how to fight true spiritual warfare. Yeah. How many are you willing to sign up for that? Robert said he's in. Yeah, wow, word over the world. Uh, <laughs> word of wisdom, if you're going to go, go all in. If you're going to live this Christ life, go all in. 
We've got to stop living l lukewarm, mediocre, half, you know what, behind lives and step into the fullness that we've called to. And you are complete in him. Everything needed, every resource su is supplied, all the fullness, all the capacity of the God and Christ in you is in there. But it will not come forth till you and I go forth. If nothing else today, get this. Go forth with who you're created to be. One time when Smith was waiting at a bus stop, a woman was having trouble getting her small dog, <laughs> getting her small dog to obey, which had followed her to go home. Sure, she's tried sweet, and talk, sweet talking. Oh, come on, little Toby. Go home, Toby. Toby, Toby, go home. Toby, go home. Oh, my gosh. Mediocre life, right? Mediocre. Living in the dusty plains and flats of the emptiness of despair. So what'd she do? <laughs> she tried sweet talking, right? That's what we said. Asking to go home, please. But after a while of trying to do this with no results, no avail, the woman stamped her foot and said, go home at once. And the dog immediately took off home and its tail between its legs. Now that's how you need to treat the devil. I remember that re one of the things was, was with that lady and I was sharing how that we were with, the, it was in Colorado a month or so ago, two months ago, whatever. And the lady's leg was short, you know, it was short. And I said, she's holding her legs and I've shared this in more detail. And I said, command the leg to grow out. Leg, it's like leg, it would be nice if you grew out. <laughs> leg, leg grow out, leg uh, get longer. No. Command the leg to grow out. Leg, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to grow out now. Whoop! Leg grew out. The doctor told her she had a short leg. She goes back to the doctor and shows him my leg is normal. How did that happen? God, <laughs> a believer, this girl, the woman that had never seen a miracle before in life, operated a miracle. What do you think the impact was on her heart and life? That's why I love to have other people do the miracles because I know what I got. But when you know and you got, bang to boom, kingdom manifestation comes forth and you won't quit. So the dog immediately took off home, tail between its legs. Go home. <laughs> Come out. <laughs> Be free. Bones mend. Eyes open. Ears here. If it's any harder than that... <laughs> We're trying to do it in our own ability, but it's not in our ability. It's in his ability that's been deposited in us in fullness, completeness. This was Smith's attitude toward the devil. Every moment of every walking day, he literally traveled the world's 20s, 30s, 40s, so on and so forth. And thousands were saved and healed everywhere he went. Not one or two, thousands. He would arrive at a place unknown to him and unheralded. Sometimes people didn't know who he was, who he was coming. But within days, there would be thousands thronging to hear the power of God demonstrated in meetings that was so great. God was truly glorified everywhere he went. You know what? You call Robert and Patty to your church. You're gonna, you may start with 50 or 100, but I tell you, after a few days, or you call us to come, it's going to be different. It's going to overflow because signs, miracles, and wonders are going to run forth from the rivers of living water that are released. And you're going to do that. You are going to do that. Everywhere he went, God was glorified. It wasn't just a word in due, in due season. It was the manifestation of the kingdom and fullness. Understand? People were coming to God, crying out to God. People were getting delivered. So here's a man that walked in the very, lived in the very presence of God. How about you and I? In so many ways, he was very natural, down to earth, real person, just like us. But he wasn't of, afraid of taking a stand firmly and speaking forth life. And if it needed to be a rebuke, he rebuked whatever it was. Oh, his object was that his heart was to be in constant. <clears throat> Unbroke, excuse me, 
unbroken communion with the Father. He had spent hours and days fervently seeking God in his early years, but later it was although his life was a combination of incessant prayer and praise, and every word and act was a work of worship. Steph, good morning, Steph. Instead, he had learned the secret of being continuous, intimate, intimate communion in the deep place, the deep calling of deep, with his Father. Even when he was in a crowd of people, he just kept walking by faith. He was in the Spirit all the time. Yes, Steph, good morning. So good to hear. There are two sides of baptisms. He, this is what he says. He says there was a vital secret. This is one of the vital secrets to his success, he says. He says two sides to the baptism. The first, to possess the Spirit, to have that Christ-life nature in you, to be endued with power from on high. <clears throat> the second is that the Spirit possesses you. Not possesses you like a devil spirit, but you are so hungering and thirsting to manifest that life that's in you. That's the life. That comes forth when nothing of this earth so captures you and holds your imagination or holds your desires, holds your thoughts, and anything you have is what God has created and done for you by sending the Christ life and putting Him in you. When nothing else so matters as that, all of that comes forth. When you let go of all the 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 trappings of the world, the snares of the world that so try to, you know, the, the sin of the world that tries to trap us and we start rising above, that's when the greatness comes forth. So, um, he counted the cost, Smith Wigglesworth, Jesus Christ, Apostle Paul, Peter, Maria Woodworth Etter, right? Some of the people we've looked at, Moses, who <laughs> have, they counted the cost and everything that was God's was theirs. Is everything in the kingdom yours? That's my question. Is everything that God has provided in Christ yours? Is it? Is it your now reality? Is it something you're trying to attain to? Or is it something that's yours now? Big difference. Trying to attain to is the mental ascent. Acting out on it is carrying it out. Patty says it's got her name on it. Robert said yes. Amy Battles, love it. Yes, it's ours now. It is being a possessor of the nature of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's ours and we live it. We know what it is to live in the flesh. Do you know what it is to live in the spirit in constant communion with God? One occasion, one occasion as I was traveling to uh, Cardiff, South Wales, I had been in much prayer, Smith says, Smith Wigglesworth, on the journey. The carriage was full of people whom I knew to be unsaved, but as there was so much talking and joking, I could not get in a word for my master. You ever been in a place like that? Listen to what happens. They were just so filled with the world, that's what people talk about, unsaved, right? So as the train was nearing the station, I thought I would wash my hands, and as I would return to the carriage, a man jumped up and said, Sir, you convince me of sin, you convict me, you know, of sin, and fell on his knees there and then. Soon the whole carriage of people were crying out in the same way they said, Who are you? What are you? You convince us, you convict us of sin. This episode reminds me very much of another bold, forthright, and anointed evangelist, Charles Finney. Ever heard about Charles Finney? He goes into a factory and all the workers fall down. They're convicted of where they're at because the light is there, right? And it's the light is in you. Are you releasing it? Are we releasing it? So this Charles Finney, who found that after a mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit some years before, even passing comments, in passing comments, he made pierced people to the heart with conviction of sin. He had gone on to become one of the greatest revivalists of all times. He died in 1875. And we got like Twitter and all these things. We got all these connections. 
what are we doing with our connections and what are we, what kind of life and light and emblazing empowerment are we releasing through the the waves of our, in, in waves to our world and through the air waves and electric waves and all of that so smith had a great emphasis on purity and holiness like all true revivalists he said you must make every day to reach higher ground every day to reach higher ground how many of you are reaching higher ground every day i won't i won't ask you to answer that <laughs> you and god figure that out you must deny yourself to make progress with god you must deny yourself to make progress with god you must refuse everything that is not pure and holy. God wants you pure in heart. He wants you to have an intense desire for holiness. I remember one, all of us. I remember one incident that sticks out in my mind, pretty mellow to you. I found over the years there was always something in the world that attracted me, that I wanted, wanted, desired, and some of those things I had, but it always kept me from walking with God because of that thing. So it wasn't long ago, more recent and last six months or so, that I all of a sudden had a thought, I would like to have a Can-Am motorcycle. You know what a Can-Am is? Three wheels, two wheels in the front. And I was like, yeah, that would be really cool. God, I'd like to have a Can-Am motorcycle. And it was like, for a minute, <laughs> maybe five, it was like my thoughts went to having this Can-Am motorcycle. And you know what I did? I said, God, I give that up to you. I'm pursuing you. You supply the rest. <laughs> I remember I did that longer ago. I wanted a total gym. You know what a total gym exercise gym is? And I saw one on TV. Oh, you could make $80 a month payments and get a total gym. What a deal. $80 a month payments. I said, God, I'm giving that one to you. Within a year, someone called me and says, I told nobody. I told nobody. Call me and says, I have a total gym. Would you like it? And it wasn't the cheap model. It was the good one. <laughs> you know what? It's a good place to rest in the God and let him just bring things to you instead of you trying to strive and strain for it and walk away from walking in the purity and holiness that he has for you. So, uh, he said two things will keep you out of, get you to leap out of yourselves in the promises of God today. One is purity, the other is faith, and it's kindled more and more, kindled, you know, enhanced, more into a flame by purity. The one statement contains is probably the key secret to Smith Wigglesworth outstanding success in God. And it's obviously a key that is well worth remembering for us today. Also, point to remember is that Smith was very aware of the dangers of money and guarded himself carefully, carefully against the possibility of covetousness entering in. He was truly beyond reproach in this area also. It is my belief that Smith Wigglesworth was a kind of direct forerunner of the kind of ministries that are about to rise in our day. I believe that the coming, this is what somebody's saying, okay, that the uh, coming apostolic ministries who will be bearers of true revival in these last days will combine the daring, miracle-working faith of Smith Wigglesworth with a deeply convicting repentance preaching of Charles Finney. And they will move under a mighty anointing that combines the best of these type of ministries. What glorious days these will be. Smith Wigglesworth fell asleep. He died in 1946 at the age of 87. A flame of God to the very end. May he be an example to us. What's it say in uh, Hebrews? We have this great cloud of witnesses. This great uh, example. Wow. <laughs> Oh, that was God. Now you didn't see it. Anyway, there was like, yeah, anyways. What you up to, Father? <laughs> anyway, we are the sons and daughters of God. And this is the day and time and hour we get to manifest the kingdom on earth. Will you be one that comes before the Father, submits yourself fully, humbles yourself, comes broken for the fullness of his filling, that Christ in you that's been put in you, but where your heart is so his and you already know his heart is so yours that no 
impossibility will stand in your way. God bless. Love you all. Hey, Joe, have an incredible day. So much more to this man and others. But what I want to read is the story of what God does in your life. That's what I want to hear. Give praise and glory to God. Hallelujah. All right. Facebook's down. Let's finish that. All right. Look, so Friday, we're going to have some ministry time right now. Will you be one of the rarities, the rare ones that will go all in with God, go further than others have gone? We've read about, been reading in this series about people doing great things. I want to read about you doing great things. Will you so enter into the presence of God as you go forth, his presence is released. The light and glory of his kingdom so comes forth that multitudes, many come to Christ, that many are, of course, saved, come to Christ, many are healed, and that when you're ministering in a church, it's not the same 50 people, but it multiplies day by day. We're not into adding, we're into multiplying. God is waiting on you. What was that? I, that quote that Patty gave me that she wrote. I'm going to go back to that at near near the beginning. Oh, I kind of know it. Um, most people are waiting on God, but God is waiting on you and I. Go forth in who you are created to be. I love you. Go forth. Bye-bye.